We're going to start, I think, gathering the results as well. So, uh, at about 60 say yes to interviews as well. So, we should say, yeah. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Really glad to see you all. Um, and for those joining us from uh, parts elsewhere, welcome to Utah State University. We're very glad to have all of you here together. Uh, we also welcome our Zoom audience. There are several joining us via Zoom. I particularly would like to welcome and thank our 10 faculty members who will be uh, presenting to us. As you know, this is our speed showcase which means uh, they have precisely three minutes and no more. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Dan Fleming, who's going to be uh, my timekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> so he's uh, there with, I should have given him a, a staff in hand, a crook in hand, um, but he'll be our timekeeper. We're going to go in order. They will have three minutes. Uh, Afterwards, after our essentially what will be a half hour, you'll be able to ask any kind of question. So what I'd like to do is have a half hour presentation, kind of stream of consciousness, just go, go, go. And then after our half hour, there will be 15 minutes where uh, those of you who are on Zoom, those of you who are in the room with us are certainly welcome to ask any questions that may come up, or at that point, give any snipe remarks that may come up. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Sean Whiteman, who is uh, actually the college's associate dean for research. Uh, and uh, Dan, of course, will tell you exactly when you can go. Mm -hmm. Who did start? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a start for the next person. Yeah. Now. <laughs> is there an advance, or are we just using the keyboard? Use the keyboard. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to our guests from not Utah State, all the people that are visiting us and, um, you know, considering us for graduate school. It's wonderful to have you here, and I hope you like what you hear about some of the work that we're doing. Um, I'm Sean Waitman. I am a professor of human development and family studies here, and I'm the associate dean for research, apparently. <laughs> Somebody tell him he's the dean. I want to tell you about who I am and how I see the world. Uh, as a researcher, I am someone who looks at the intersections between um, family relationships and youth development. I take a very Bronfenbrennerian lens to look at the ways that youth develop. We have our individuals in the center that are surrounded by these microsystems, right? These various relationships and microprocesses that shape us on a daily basis, which is surrounded by our communities, our schools, our neighborhood, which is surrounded by our culture, things such as systemic racism, cultural strengths. And then we have our time. We're in a very interesting time right now, right? We have a pandemic. We have World War III starting. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm very interested in how all these interactions shape development. I'm particularly interested in something that's not in this figure. We have in our microsystems here, parents, peers, mentors, spiritual communities, teachers, social media, health providers, people that are very important in our lives. And something that 80% of us have is not listed in there called siblings. Most of us grow up in a home with a household with a sibling. More of us have siblings than fathers in our household. Why are they not here? Why are we not paying scholarly attention to them? It's really curious to me because there's actually quite a bit of scholarly or quite a bit of attention on siblings in the lay literature. Time has produced a series of uh, issues just focused on siblings with the cover story, The Secrets of Birth Order, Why Mom Like You Best, The Science of Favoritism, and How Your Siblings Make You Who You Are. And so why does scholarly 2.4% of the research in the last, from 2008 to 2018, in family science journals, family science journals, focus on siblings. Paper this came out well, two weeks ago that said that. So why are we not studying that? Why are siblings ignored? Um, I don't know why they're ignored. I don't ignore that. That's what I do. <laughs> I'll try to convince you this is why we should study them. Siblings can influence one another directly and indirectly through our day-to-day -day interactions with each other. We can act as social partners. We can shape each other's by serving as models or advisors, or even sources that we can differentiate, foils. We also indirectly influence one another through sources of comp social comparison. I can compare how much time? 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, this is what I do. Dude, dude, done. <laughs> All right, what I care about are the processes that underlie similar similarities in their substance use. We have a NIH-funded R01 right now that we're trying to understand 
the processes that undergird sibling similarities and health risk behaviors. We propose this integrated framework in which these mediating processes are micro or that are moderated by the overall quality uh, of the sibling relationship to try to see where we go. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. <laughs> You said it so nicely in that British accent. I love it. Tell me more. We all need this sibling sharing report. Come on, sorry. So have fun if you have work. Okay, so. Damn, we should have So I'm newly at, at in family, uh, family finance area, so I deal with the money issue. So I have two research frame uh, in my uh, research agenda. One is family finance. So uh, I look at the, uh, the trend and issues surrounding uh, financial well-being, financial behavior such as credit card use and debt repayment, so strong on borrowing. And I also look at how uh, financial literacy and financial education influence how, uh, financial outcomes. So that is my main uh, framework. Uh, I use the data set from National Financial Capability Study. Uh, every three years, they collect the data. 27,000 households uh, uh, provide information related to family finance matter. So I use this uh, uh, data set to understand this uh, framework. And my next uh, research area is uh, family business. So for the past 20 years, I have focused on uh, family-owned small business, small businesses, and you can represent the uh, representative uh, multi multi state level 15 states are uh, involved with this family business research project so i look at the uh, how uh, business success they are and then uh financial intermingling between family system and business system and also uh family business is so important in economy so 90 percent it is family owned so succession planning is so important so i also do uh, do that and the work and family interface, there is not much boundary uh, as a family business owner. So I look at that uh, area. So this is the I open use my research education in family finance area. So when you look at here, all these different facets interact each other and then they influence uh, financial well-being. In particular, I'm interested in some group uh, like to uh, millennials and all the other minority group that include racial minority and single woman and low income family. That is my area of research. And for my family business research, I often use this model sustainable family business. So family business have a disruption. <laughs> they have some time interruption from economic downturn and COVID impact. And they also they have a natural disaster. Then how they use the family resource and hidden resource and respond to this disruption, and they want to uh, achieve a sustainable of a business and family. So right now, I'm working for three topics: workaholism of family business owner. Second, uh, I work with the uh, succession issue, exit issue, uh, whether they sell the business or give to uh, the children. So like that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so my main interests in research are focusing on cultural and family strengths based in communities. I am very interested, particularly in indigenous communities, the similarities and how we can learn from different cultures. So I get really excited about visiting different places um, because we're so place-based and kind of like our environment also influences our family, our um, what resources we have. So this collage of pictures are the places that I study. The um, fox and snow is from my backyard. Um, that's the Logan one. So one of my main areas is looking at um, family literacy and family bookmaking following the talk story tradition in Hawaii. So right now I'm working on two um, 
as the evaluator on two grants there with colleagues. I have a big project that I'm working on, um, caregiving and child development in Ecuador. As we have several faculty in this room, I'm not giving them any of my seconds to name them, <laughs> who are working on this NIH funded, um, not it, NIH proposal that we're hoping to get funded and a doc student who's looking at nutrition. Um, we have 50 families from the Amazon that she's using for her dissertation. I'm also really interested in using uh, stories and legends, um, particularly in indigenous communities to inform and create science curriculum. I I'm not real excited about this idea that anybody, anything that's produced in Boston can be distributed anywhere and that's how preschoolers should learn. So I, I'm working with several colleagues to really find out what's going on in communities, how families can support the preschool education and we can get more scientists, especially as we're trying to manage climate change. We need more indigenous scientists. And then finally, this picture is our um, master student, Matt Cook, who's, this is his thesis, um, but he's looking at using FNIRS to um, look at differences between monolingual and bilingual preschoolers executive functioning. We're also looking at, um, this is what we're also trying to get pilot data on because we'll be looking at this in Ecuador with our, um, with our infants and toddlers of adolescent mothers there. Right now, we're also looking for funding to buy a second FNIRS unit so we can do hyper scanning with couples and um, parents and children, as well as among peers. So we can be looking at blood oxygenation levels in pairs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Hi everyone, my name is Julia Yan. I am assistant professor here. Um, really new, I graduated from my PhD in human development and family science uh, from Ohio State University in 2020. And in 2019, I also got my master's degree in applied statistics. So that's why in addition to the infancy and child development courses, I also teach quantitative courses in longitudinal data analysis and dyadic data analysis. And a little bit about, um, what I'm interested in. So my work focused on basically two lines of work. The first line addresses the family influences on child emotion dysregulation. So how you know fathers and mothers could do things to contribute to the uh, development of children's emotional skills. And in addition to the direct effects, I also look at um, the mediating mechanism. So um, what are some of the like intermediate steps that would translate some of this risk or protective factors into um, emotion regulation, dysregulation. Like maybe um, sleep is one of the potential mechanisms that we're looking at that could translate, say, family conflict uh, with you know, parents and siblings um, to children's uh, impulse control difficulties. That's one of the projects that we're currently working on right now. And um, beyond mediating mechanisms and also looking at, you know, what are some potential moderating factors and resilience factors, right? So we know that when parents have issues, some children fare well, some children, you know, suffer from it. What are some of the factors that could distinguish these uh, types of um, children and families? Are there some things that other adults that do that could help? Or, you know, is there some individual resilience factors or is there any uh, contextual factors like poverty and racism are part of um, what I'm addressing right now? Okay. And so that's the first line. We basically established that fathers and mothers could contribute. Then. Um, my next step is move a little bit upstream and focus on, you know, what makes a parent a good one, right? What could um, predict parents' parenting behaviors and their adjustment to the parenthood? Um, so I look like, you know, this is a busy figure, a bunch of factors uh, surrounding the, the center of parenting. And Thank you. It's time for adolescence. <laughs> 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so as an end note, I use a lot of uh, large scale national data sets in my study. Um, we have like tens or not tens, thousands or tens of thousands of families followed across 
uh, from birth of the child all the way to 15 or even I think they recently collected 26, 28 gave the data. So we um I'm really excited of where this lines of work are leading us. And thank you so much. Y'all are familiar with the Ebenhaus curve. You won't remember anything I say or Diana says uh, for our presentation. So there you go. Troy Beckert, um, I've never even completed a sentence in three minutes. So I'll try to make this thing work. I'm really interested in adolescent psychosocial development. And the more I study adolescent psychosocial development, the more I'm convinced that the contextual factors um, that relate to adolescent psychosocial development are the things that I want to look at. So I I look specifically at family influences. I'm interested in parents. I'm interested in um, mothers, fathers, and grandparents and the relationship that they have with adolescents. I'm also interested in parent and peer attachment. And over time, I've become interested and disinterested in social media's influence because it's like nailing jello to a tree. It is just something that you think would work until you start to look at it. And man, um, it's challenging. Throughout that process, I became really aware of the influence that culture can have. And so I focus specifically on the types of cultural influences that come from uh, collectivistic versus individualistic cultures. And so I've taken three cultures who kind of represent this mix between them from the United States, from um, Taiwan, and from Italy. And they kind of give a nice mix of how these things work together. Um, my, my end goal is usually to find out how cognitive autonomy relates to all of these things. And in order to do that, I look at identity development, I look at self-esteem, and I look at these attachments. So um, specifically research that I have data that we're working on currently, um, we looked at how people balance, how parents balance life and family. And specifically now we've looked at that through the lens of the pandemic and how um, COVID has impacted that balancing act that goes on. Um, I'm also um, working diligently on, someone's calling me right now. That's <laughs> uh, worked on um, how parents transmit their morals and values to their kids. Um, and then finally, um, this idea of looking into how adolescents use social media for their own self-assessment. So how they use social media to process their own identity. Um, some overuse it, some underuse it, and there seems to be this nice little niche where social media actually helps um, with some of those things. Peace out. Hi, um, I'm Diana Meter, and I usually never get nervous for any sort of public speaking, but I just felt like this rush, but we've got to do this in three minutes. Okay, so um, I'm an assistant professor here, and I'm really interested in peer groups, peer relationships, and more specifically, bullying and peer victimization and aggression among youth. There's a lot of research on aggressors, aggressors or bullies and a lot of research on victims, but what we don't know a lot about are the defenders. These are the individuals who take an active role, maybe putting themselves in a risky situation by standing up for others who are experiencing victimization. Um, and there's people who study this behavior in different contexts. When there is an emergency, when there is um, some sort of harm against others, who are the people who have the gumption to actually intervene? Um, and so I'm interested in what predicts doing this. I'm also interested in different contexts in which this behavior may occur more or less. So if we think about specific types of victimization, people being bullied or victimized because of their race or ethnicity, because of their gender, because of their sexual orientation, <laughs> people's willingness to defend or not. Um, and if we do see differences, what is actually predict predicting these differences? And this might look a little bit um, similar to Sean's slide, but a little bit spread out. So this is um, victimization in context. In order to understand these things, we can't just look at the individuals and we can't just look at the couple of kids involved in the peer victimization situation, but we have to understand other factors. Um, things like family characteristics, the behavior that's modeled and um, directly taught to youth. We have to look at the peer characteristics. What are the social norms for the peer group this kid's hanging out with? What's the social norm for the school? Is there a positive school climate? Is there 
a pro-LGBTQ climate, that's gonna make a difference on what these kids are experiencing in that context. And we also have to pay attention to the community and the larger culture. There's research to suggest that things happening politically, things happening um, in, the, in the broader community also have an impact on the things that are happening among individuals in the school. So I study these things and I wanna also, if I don't, whether I measure it or in a particular study, don't measure it, take into account the fact that these things matter and we cannot ignore the impact that they have on peer victimization and bullying. Um, but of course, we're researchers, right? We have a thousand different research interests. So I wanted to show you a little bit about of the other things that I look at. Um, one of my main focuses also is meta-analysis. I teach the class here. And um, I just think it's a really interesting and fun, if you know you like me, way to take all of the information from a certain research area and put it together into a meaningful whole. And I really like teaching other people how to do that because I think it's such an important part um, of research. I also love learning about different research methods, different ways of collecting data, and how those can be useful in learning about things, but also how they're interesting just in and of themselves. Do we learn different things from different types of data collection? Hey, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Travis Dorsch. I'm an associate professor uh, in the human development area of our department and, and founding director of the Families in Sport Lab. Families in Sport to me are like peanut butter and jelly. And I think um, they go together so well. Sean gave a statistic about homes that have young people with siblings and about the same statistic, about 80% of young people will at some point participate in youth sport. So for me, while some of my colleagues study youth in contexts such as education in the home and even in the Ecuadorian Amazon, it's pretty cool. If you need an RA, let me know. <laughs> I, I study youth and their families and their context in youth, youth sport. Why? I, I heard someone say one time, and it really struck me that we study what we are. And I was fortunate to participate in youth sport, in adolescent sport, and even sport at the highest level. And it gave me a frame of reference. It gave me a worldview that parents and families and our broader communities can be super, super impactful in how we develop but not only that, that we can actually be impactful through our journey in how those people develop and how those contexts develop. So to me, it's always been reciprocal in nature. At every step of the way for me, my parents were super involved. And I think that gave for me a life lesson in that sport is about more than just the athlete, but it's, around, it's about the people who surround the athlete and their journeys are shaped and changed as well through that process. Now in college, um, I didn't do a lot of going to class, but I did do a lot of reading, okay? I was an avid reader and I read, I read textbooks, I read magazines, I read empirical work, uh, I read some of these lay books and it gave me a, very, uh, a passion for youth sport and how youth sport can, can impact culture. And I think it's helped provided me a worldview or a lens on what I do today. And you can see here, like a lot of my colleagues, um, I sit at the intersection of, assist, of systems thinking and ecological thinking. Of course, most of my work uses as developmental variables, the athlete and outcomes that athletes experience but I also am very interested, and this is kind of where I hang my hat as a researcher, on family processes and family outcomes that result from participation in youth sport. I've become more interested through some work with my colleagues on team processes and team outcomes uh, that result uh, from an athlete's participation. I'm also, more recently in my career, interested in how the organizations, how the communities, and how broader society both impact and are impacted by youth participation in sport. So you can see here that it's not just about the athlete. I had my athletic journey, young people today are having theirs, but all of these people and all of these contexts that surround young people are quite important as well. And in my last 20 or so seconds, I really want to acknowledge because none of us have a research line without the people that we work with. Um, my eight grad students that I've had over the course of my time here at USU, and I wanna include Valeria, who many of you know, she visited us last semester um, as a Fulbright fellow, as well as the 60 plus undergrads that have contributed to all this work, thank you. <laughs> you did mention about your daughter field research. She's great. She's awesome. And that's a real work application of his research. Um, <laughs> well, that's not awesome. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's do this. So I'm Min, and uh, welcome to Utah State University. So, um, 
<laughs> I'm a developmental psychologist by training, and uh, I take a life course uh, perspective on aging. So my area is in adult development and aging. And uh, this picture shows a 19th century view of uh, our life course. It's called the steps of life. So my research is broadly focused on individual's health and well-being across adult adulthood, the entire adulthood and uh, older age. And uh, with that focus, um, I, my expertise is in research methodology, for example, uh, intensive longitudinal methods and multi-level modeling techniques. And then Fleming can tell you all about that. And um, um, and I also study different forms of stressor exposure. For example, daily hassles, malfunctioning computers, traffic, and uh, chronic, more chronic forms of stress. You know, taking care of a family member you love, um, and your chronic health condition. And I also study early adversity. You know, um, single parent case, um, and also trauma trauma patterns experience early in life and how that different forms of stressor exposure might impact your health on you while you are an adult. Um, I also study the contextual factors and mechanism of the stress health association. For example, recently we um, studied how relationship quality might impact the stress health association. And uh, I also studied the um, uh, physiology of the stress and health association. For example, um, cellular biomarkers of stress and how that impacts your health. Wow. And finally, we also studied the interventions to stressor uh, to reduce stressor exposures and promote healthy aging. For example, um, a form of uh, caregiving respect um, adult day services and how that might impact your um so that's me and this sculpture i think it's in london and maybe he knows dan knows uh, it's called the the seven ages of man i think um and shows you how you might change from early on to the old ages and uh let me know any questions you may have thank you Hi everyone, it's great to be with you. Hello to those of you on Zoom as well. I'm Erin Goddard, I'm Associate Professor in Human Development and Family Studies. And I put together all the titles from um, all, all my uh, articles that I published. So what I think you can see stand out is that I'm very interested in parenting and in families and in children and adolescents academic related um, outcomes. Some of the work that I've done that has excited me the most has been those studies that are longitudinal in which I can study both between and within change. Um, I'm also really interested in perspectives from multiple reporters. So a parent report as well as a child report. For some people that is messy and noisy and um, may be indicative of incongruencies, but I like studying and trying to understand those different perspectives and what, um, what it means when we have divergent reports. So I am a quantitative researcher. I like those kinds of methods of multi-reporter, studying change over time between and within person. Uh, I can't tell you all about my journey, but I do think it's important to share with you just a couple pieces that I think have shaped who I am as a researcher, as a person, and, and my interest. And that starts at the beginning of my undergraduate experience being a first generation college student, having um, mentors of, of color that were supportive to me, that uh, working in student access and success and retention, then going on to Penn State and uh, obtaining my degrees, both master's and PhD in human development and family studies. Again, working with faculty of color, studying normative developmental processes among underrepresented families um, have shaped a lot of what I'm interested in. And that centers around parenting and parent child relationships, developmental competencies, especially those in which that are connected to things like um, academic achievement and school engagement, and the interplay that uh, race ethnicity has for both of these, these things as well. 
And I do like to study these things over time. So some of my work has examined factors either in parenting or in child-related outcomes very early in childhood, throughout the school years, throughout childhood and adolescence, and then into young adulthood. A few of the things that um, I'm spending, <laughs> so we're spending most of my time right now, falls into those two, two lines of work. Um, one project examines adolescence experiences of bias and discrimination and how parenting processes like microprotection and adolescent disclosure protect against those um, harmful effects of discrimination and bias. And then among underrepresented students, how STEM identity, which is a key factor in persistence and achievement in STEM, uh, how that plays out both for students that are attending a predominantly white institution versus a historically black university or college, and um, studying identity change over time among refugee adolescents uh, as well. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm Ryan Seedall. I'm a marriage and family therapist. And I guess one of the big questions that I was thinking about as I uh, talk about my interests is I really want to know what it does it take for what do I need to understand to be able to help people in relationships change? And so I think that's where my interest areas really lie. Um, one is improving relationship process. That's inside, outside the therapy room. Um, in, in reality, uh, I, I like that quote, um, a great relationship is one in which two people are deeply committed to one another and deeply invested in promoting one another's welfare, at least as much as their own and are reasonably successful in doing so. Um, so there's two, three main prongs to this. One, I'm uh, a big fan of attachment theory. And I think the reason why I like it is as a therapist, um, I'm very interested in uh, patterns and in processes and interaction patterns, how, how they work. And attachment theory really helps me understand how couples work. And the way I've thought of it a lot is, um, when things are going well in a partnership, you have clear signaling and sensitive and attuned responding. And a lot of times when I'm working with couples, uh, something's, something's off with the signaling or responding. So I really like that area. Um, I'll actually go to the third one first, because I think it's more uh, common that we look at couple conflict. Um, how do, how do couples uh, conflict and, and what's good and what's, what's not good? Um, I think something that we is maybe understudied in this area is the repair. I think there's a lot of couples, a lot of families that they repair by not talking to each other and eventually just slowly getting back to interaction. Um, when in reality, there are key, key ways of repairing. Um, and yet, in, in addition to conflict, there's this idea of social support, that third element of, will you be there for me when things go right or when things go wrong? Co conflict is very uh, relationship focused, right? So my partner is the source of my distress, but what about when um, something else is the source of my distress? Can my partner support me? Three minutes already? 30 seconds left. All right, well, good. Um, the second one. We got this. That was my main one, right? <laughs> the second one's improving MFT intervention in the therapy room, right? So enactments, it's getting the couple uh, or the family to talk to each other. Um, that sounds like it's not very novel, but sometimes there's a real challenge with how to do that. Deliberate practice is how you improve as a therapist. And I've done some work there, um, done some physiological work with skin conductance and things of that nature to really understand emotional experience. And then the last one's a little, I think, more broader, time. <laughs> I'm going to finish my sentence. <laughs> Don't this gong me. I, <laughs> yes, this is why I, I love. He knew I'd go on and on and on. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
<laughs> do you really understand what kind of therapy we do here? <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking all 10 professors. <laughs> I would like to open it up uh, for your questions, but before I do, now that we can breathe for a minute, this was this is actually an experiment in um, uh, anxiety. You know, thank you. <laughs> Did get this past my nose. Um, but uh, now that we've got a little bit of a minute to breathe, I'd like also to uh, introduce and thank Dr. Al Smith, dean of the college, for being here with us. Let's show the interest that you do and that you're getting to know uh, all the many things that go on in this college. So thank you, thank you. We appreciate this time. Uh, floor is yours. I'd like to have us just ask questions. And uh, I'd also, I'd welcome any individual questions to, to the various faculty members that you heard from. Uh, but I would also like to broaden it to the extent that you'd like to broaden the discussion. There are some professional questions that, that you may care to ask. So um, any questions, comments? Good job, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Interrupting and being interrupted is my biggest pet peeve. But I hate <laughs> Didn't we choose well? <laughs> Uh, I thought um, I would give my own three minute presentation in three seconds. I study relationship education. <laughs> but yeah, I'd, I'd welcome uh, any questions with regard to, you know, some of the places or some of the ways that folks study. Um, one question that I, I thought maybe would kind of kick us off is, um, and this is for, for y'all faculty as well, uh, why Utah State? What allows you to do what you do here? And why would you say choose Utah State? I know my answer. <laughs> yeah. um, so one thing that I love seeing um, is that the faculty in this department and across this college and the students in this department um, are extremely collaborative. And I know that's not the case in all schools and departments. Um, but a lot of us collect data together, a lot of us mentor students together. Um, I think it makes it more enjoyable, it gives people sort of a support system. That's something that I really appreciate about working here. Thanks, Diana. I'll also chime in that, as you could tell from those 10 presentations, there's such an overlap, and yet we're all doing our own thing. And so it, it makes for a synergistic feeling within the faculty because we feel like we're working together and we all can pursue our own interests at the same time. Yes, thank you, Troy. I'm oh, coming I'm, in as a student, I'm sorry. I love you, USU. By the way, when you, when you speak, um, thank you for pressing the button. There's the little, like right in on the front of it, it says push and just keep pushing it while you speak. Thank you. Brian. I learned this the hard way this morning. Um, okay, so USU, I, I originally thought about it because my brother came here and I thought he loved it so much, but he's in civil engineering, nothing to do with HDFS. So when I came here and was interested, um, and I talked with a lot of faculty members and they're super supportive of what I wanted to pursue, but also gave me tons of opportunities, both research and outside of research, um, practicum, those things. And it's opened up so many doors for me in my personal pursuits, professional pursuits, academics, everything. And it's really changed a lot about um, even my like future goals. And they've been so supportive here. And so I advocate for here. That's why I kept it, my master's here and undergraduate. And so USU is a place to be, I think, for several reasons. but. Um, overall, the support that's given and the resources here are awesome. I'll second that. I came in um, with like training in exercise science, uh, and in two years, like the teaching and guidance and support from the faculty had me ready for comprehensive exams. Um, I've been able to like pursue my own area of research really freely, but also have like been invited for authorship on papers to do with caregiving with dementia and stuff like that as well. So just really expanding everything and not being limited to like one unique pathway. 
Chad. Yeah, I'll expand on that, that I have, after my first conversation with Travis, when I was uh, going through the recruitment process, I got off our Zoom call and was like, I could work with that guy for four years, um, which I didn't feel with all of the conversations with uh, prospective um, mentors. And Wait, you've been done four? Yeah, so you've been for five years though. I only have funding for four. I got to leave unless someone has more funding. Um, and all of the professors I've had have treated me like a person first and a researcher and a student second, uh, whether or not they are my mentor, my major advisor, they're on my committee, or just like random faculty members I see in the hall. Um, they're always concerned about, is Kat, is Kat doing okay? And then is Kat's work and scholarship doing okay? And I very much appreciate that. I'm gonna say something as a broader field is that you saw in the presentations that folks were focusing on the intersections of relationships and development or context and development. And that's the heart of HDFS, right? That's what makes HDFS departments different than developmental psychology programs. It's this focus on interactions. Yuri Brown from Brenner said, it's, the action is in the interactions. And that's where we're right. We study people in place not in an isolated lab. Now, some of us do, we bring people in the labs, not that that's wrong, but understanding people in their place and how their environment shapes those interactions and shapes their development over time and shapes those relationships, I think is the right lens. And that's why I'm passionate about HDFS as a, as a discipline, it's an interdisciplinary field, but as a discipline, we take this lens. And I think you saw that across the multiple presentations and that's the thing that unites us. Uh, and makes it a fun place to work is that we have similar systemic lenses. I'll add that one of the things that I think is special about uh, both the university and this department is that uh, Utah State is the land grant. And we, especially in this department, we take that seriously. And we are doing some, I think, very high powered work uh, and exemplary work in terms of taking the research that's out there and extending it across the state. Uh, I'm down the hill at FCHD West, and sometimes we look at each other and say, yeah, you know, pretty much the state is our therapy room, but we're preventative. You know, we're, pre we're, we're preventing really so many, uh, so many issues, and we can collaborate so easily with, uh, with the rest of the faculty in the department, which is a fantastic thing. So it's a great balance between uh, applied research and, um, and basic research you can get experience and expertise in both. I don't think my microphone works. Um, anyway, I, 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 someone on Zoom unmuted and then there's something like ah. that. Asking about that. Yes. Uh, someone on Zoom did have a question, I think. Ah. No questions from Zoom? Jackie? No. Okay, I guess we don't. Please. So how about living environment in Utah? So I uh, was involved in family business research project for 20 years. So for 10 years, every year we host each university rotate, uh, host the uh, annual meeting. But uh, they said, no, no, I don't want to go to Utah because too far away, because uh, most of them are Indiana or, uh, or Minnesota, those area. But when they come here, came here uh, five years ago, they look at the environment, such a nice place. So they wanted to come back right after uh, five years, they want to sacrifice the traveling and then they enjoy the last year because the uh, surrounded by mountain and then a college town, but we have everything in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, uh, living environment is great with us, the university. It's not always this cold. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> cold. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, other comments? Now, of course, you're going to have, uh, you'll have time to get with individual faculty, et cetera, to ask more specific questions. But other comments from faculty, other, other questions from students or perspective? Please. Yes, if you would. Thank you. Okay. I had a question um, 
for Dr. Meter. Is that how you? I, whenever I was like on the way, I don't know where I was going a couple weeks ago. I actually, because I've never really done anything with like bullying or anything like that. I saw an article. And I've never seen anything like this. Have you ever done anything like pro-social behaviors that a, a bullier might have? Have you ever done anything like pro-social behavior variable or anything like that? I haven't looked at that specifically in my work, but it's pretty interesting. Diana, would you mind? Oh. Yeah, thanks. I, I haven't looked at that specifically in my work, but it's an interesting question because you're sort of on the right track. So um, there are two major forms of, of bullying victimization. Sometimes they um, differ a little bit or they blend a little bit, but one's like the more physical or overt where people are you know, physically harming each other or saying nasty things. And the other is the more relational stuff that we sometimes think of as like mean girl bullying, like the eye rolling, the rumor spreading, but boys do it too. It's a rumor. It's, I mean, it's a, a myth that's just girls. But a lot of times the people who are engaging in that relationally aggressive behavior often have a lot of skills. Sometimes they engage in that behavior. And because they're socially skilled, they're, e they're able to sort of successfully use all of their different social skills to get what they want, make friends, be popular, whatever their goals are in the peer group. So there is some overlap with some studies showing that there is a positive association, some studies not that association. Yeah, thank you. I just, I, I don't even know where I saw that, but I was like, I never looked at it in that lens, like the bullying, the entire like system that that happens. I just, as soon as you started talking about that, I thought of that and wondered if you had ever done anything like that. So thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Oh, it's an interesting idea. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up. And there are some interventionists who sort of have the goal of saying, okay, these kids want attention. They want whatever it is they're trying to get from their peers by being aggressive. How can we change what they're doing so that they're, they're getting that attention in, from doing positive things? Can they excel in a certain area or can they do really great things for their community? And will that give them the same positive peer regard as bullying? So. And as a plug for Diana, she's going to be presenting uh, work on bullying at the university's Blue Plate Lunch Special in June. That's not Blue Plate Lunch Special, the Blue Plate Lunch <laughs> Series. <laughs> I, just, I just confounded two different things. Um, and, and that'll be in June in Salt Lake City. She's presenting it to the state audience um, as a part of, part of the university's focus on health and wellness. And so uh, it's been delayed twice. <laughs> um, but Diana is representing our department and our college uh, in, in this effort. So uh, we'll let you know more about it. Lots of pub will come out, but I think it's June 13th. Does that sound right? That sounds right. They keep changing it. I'm like, I think yeah. I'm so, so it's in June. <laughs> we'll go down, we'll have lunch. <laughs> we'll take that blue plate. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, I'll... Um, Again, say thank you to everyone. Oh, did, did we have, uh, please, Beth, go for it. I just thought it would be kind of cool if some of the speakers talked about some of their favorite data, data analytic tools. Because I, as I was listening to you guys speak, I was thinking we have like a huge breadth of different kinds of methodologies that our faculty use. So just to kind of get a sense of how wide that is, I was curious, not all of the ones you use, but what's your favorite? favorite analytic tool or method? <laughs> My new favorite is FNAIRS. Say what happened to this. It's um, looking at blood oxygenation levels and um, it's been really fun to work with the MFT faculty and me as a child development. Um, faculty member to really just work on this study together. I've been working with um, Spencer Bradshaw. He and I are mentoring um, Matt in his thesis, who will be a PhD student. And we're just really looking at not only the executive functioning, but then we really want to move into relationships. And what's really cool about it is we're not limited to paper and pencil measures that were developed 20 years ago on white middle-class families, but we're able to actually look at the, the blood oxygenation levels of these different, as the children are doing tasks or, um, I don't know, parents. Um, there's just so much potential for it. 
and I love it that it's not a paper and pencil measure. So it's my new favorite that I'm trying to get up to speed on. Uh, I'll call out the MFTs because we've got a couple of MFTs in the room using some interesting uh, methodologies. Well, I, I mean, I kind of mentioned the, in the addition to that, we have some. Brian, could you? Oh, yeah. so, so good. In, the, in addition to that, um, we have, you know, it's, it's just that idea of trying to really understand what's going on for a person. And they can tell you, you can observe it or you can look physiologically. And so skin conductance, we have heart rate variability. Um, we have FNIRs. Um, we've looked into respiration, but uh, it's always kind of a balance between what's gonna tell you what their experience is versus how intrusive you want it to be, right? And so um, we're always balancing that, but um, that's what we're, uh, a lot of what we're doing. Thanks, Ryan. Spencer, did you, you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think between Lisa and Ryan, uh, I'm, I'm the FNIRS guy, so <laughs> it's covered. Okay. Thank you. As someone who doesn't do paper and pencil, but does mouse and click report measures now, um, you know, analytically, we collect a lot of data on children over time. And so, as, as Aaron said, and uh, Julia said, and Ian said, you know, we're interested in studying change over time. And so many of us use advanced longitudinal methods to study these patterns of change. And there's very many of them from, you know, you can use them in a structural equation modeling framework. They do it in a multi-level modeling framework, a, mo a mixture modeling framework to understand trajectories of groups. Um, and so many of us are interested in these advanced longitudinal methods. And so we're excited that we have some of those opportunities to, to learn those techniques here, um, both in the department through classes with folks like Julia, as well as at the college level and as a part of our, um, you know, curriculum, uh, you know, at the college level. And we also have uh, just introduced last year, uh, an advanced certificate in research methods and analysis. We call it the CARMA, it's the certificate in advanced research methods and analysis. And so that's something that as students that are considering our program, you can get through, I mean, especially at, up front, if you're thinking about it, you can schedule it in as a part of your regular course of, um, you know, plan of study is what we call it and gain this extra certificate. It's almost like a minor, um, it's 15 credits. And some of those courses are already required. So in, in our departments, I think it's only one extra course <laughs> that you honestly have to take in HDFS. You take one more course than what is already prescribed. So many of us are interested in that and do that. And as a result, we have some of these um, programs and certificates available for you. Another thought is that because our faculty is large, uh, there is a lot of expertise there, there, and it's quite remarkable that we're so large and we play well in the sandbox together. Um, the, the fact that we play well in the sandbox together and that we like each other, it means that you're a lot less likely to have uh, internecine wars going on when it comes to your, <laughs> uh, when it comes to your committee. Um, because and because of what Kat said, we really do value our students. Hi everyone. We have a class in there. Okay. <laughs> we we're just finishing up. We'll let you in. <laughs> Our, okay. <laughs> so the end of my thirty seconds is that it means that you're going to be supported in not just getting out of here, but you're going to be supported in terms of your professional development. Please join me again in thanking the faculty. Thank you.